Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find the maximum sum of node values. So this is a hard problem and 100% I'm gonna show you how to solve this problem efficiently. But if there's anything you take away from this video, hopefully it is how to kind of approach really difficult problems and learn some problem solving skills from it. Those problem solving skills might not necessarily lead you to the correct solution every single time, but still these are useful skills and that's really what I try to teach so we're given an undirected graph that is specifically a tree. So immediately we should be familiar with what a tree is if we're trying to solve this problem. If you don't know what a tree is, I wouldn't even bother with this problem. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be honest. Tree is a connected graph that does not have cycles in it. So no cycles to worry about. The fact that it's connected is really the most important thing. And that's going to be very relevant to the rest of this problem. Because as you may know, with a connected graph, and specifically this one is undirected, there is going to exist a path from any two given nodes in the graph. Any two given nodes, there's going to be a path connecting them. So keep that in mind. We are also given an integer k. So k could be anything. This is really the most important parameter because what we are trying to do Take this graph, for example, since it's the simplest one, we have a node zero and one. Now, these are like the labels because we're given these nodes in a array. So this will be at the zeroth index. This will be at the first index. But these are not the values of this graph. So if you look down here, the value of this one is actually going to be two and the value of this one is actually going to be three. So I think that's what I'm going to put here. The value K in this example is seven. The idea in this problem is that we can take any edge. This one is simple. There's just a single edge but we can take any edge and when we pick this edge what we do is say take this value over here and XOR it with seven and at the same time we have to take the other value attached to that edge and XOR it with seven as well and the result is going to be the new value for each of these respective nodes and they kind of mention down here in the description that two XORD with seven is going to be five and three XORD with seven is going to be four. So these are going to be the new values. So then we'd put a five over here and we would put a four over here. Ultimately, what we're trying to do here is maximize the total sum of all the values of the nodes. So right now it looks like we increased them. Previously, the sum was two plus three, that's five. Now the sum is five plus four, that's nine. So we've increased it. But this is such a simple example, let's go again. Let's see if we can notice anything. Let's try to make it even bigger. Now I'm gonna take five and now I'm gonna XOR it down here because we have some empty space. I'm gonna XOR five with that same number K. They don't really tell us in this problem we can't do that same operation on an edge multiple times, so screw it. That's what I'm gonna do, five XOR with seven and four XOR with seven. The result of this one is gonna be two and the result of this one, funny enough, is going to be three. Does that look familiar to you? It does to me. It looks like we just got the original values back again. Um, is that a coincidence? Because when I'm looking at a problem like this one, the first thing I'm trying to do isn't actually solve the problem because this is a hard problem. I wouldn't be able to solve it in a few minutes. I don't immediately read this and automatically know how to solve it. I start to look for clues. And one of the clues I was looking for is this operation that we're doing here is the XOR operation, right? They tell us what that operation is. Like, well, they don't tell us what it is, but we know what it is. But basically, it's not like some random operation that we're doing. What I'm getting at is this operation is not a black box. We can possibly get some clues about how to solve this problem or optimize this problem by thinking about what this operation is actually doing. Take a look at this. Let's look at this. When you have two XORed with seven in binary, two looks like this, uh, zero, one, zero. Seven in binary is this. This is one, this is two, and this is four. So if you add those up, then you get seven. So if we XOR this, we're looking for the spots that there's only a single one. So we put a one over here. There's a double one over here, so we put zero. There's a single one over here, so we put one. In other words, when you look at the original number, either what's gonna happen, a zero could possibly turn into a one. If that happens, like from the original number, a zero turns into a one, like uh, down here, that must mean that there was a one over here. 
And then on the next time, if we take this same exact number and try to XOR it with the result of this, then we're going to turn that one back into a zero because now we have double ones over here. If you have a one and you turn it into a zero, then the next time you XOR it with the same number, it's going to be turned into a zero. And of course, we could look at the case where you have double zeros and double ones. That's kind of what we're doing here, actually. But ultimately, the biggest thing to notice about the XOR operation is if you have some integer n and then you XOR it with a given integer k and then you XOR it with that given integer k again, the result is always going to be n. This is a key observation if there ever existed a key observation in any problem. But even this is not enough. Let me tell you one more hint and I bet you'll be able to solve the problem without even watching the rest of this video. Remember what I mentioned earlier that any two nodes are connected? Well, let's take a look at this example and really drive that point home. We only have two edges here, so it's a little bit more complicated than this example, but still it's pretty simple. Suppose I take this edge and I do that XOR operation. Okay, so we end up XORing this one a single time. We end up XORing this one. And then suppose I choose this edge. So we end up XORing this one twice and then XORing this one once. In other words, we XOR this one twice so we don't actually change it. We only end up changing these two. Now suppose to make it even more interesting, I introduce a new node over here. And now I say I'm going to XOR this one twice because I choose this edge and then I XOR this and I also XOR this. In other words, we don't XOR this one at all. So let me just redraw this. This would be the result. This one gets XORed and this one gets XORed. And then these two in the middle actually stay the same. And if there was like some path here, we could continue doing that. So what we're noticing here is very, very important. We already know that if we choose the XOR operation, we have to pick an edge. Therefore, we have to XOR two nodes. But those two nodes actually don't need to be adjacent. It's true that we can't just pick one node and XOR it. That's 100% true. We can't just pick one. We have to XOR two nodes at a time, but those two nodes don't have to be connected by an edge. They can actually be anywhere in the graph any two nodes at a time. That's what I'm saying, that this problem, the way it was worded, was actually wrong. We have discovered a simpler version of the exact same problem. We've reworded the problem. We changed it. Now we're allowed to pick any two nodes in the graph and XOR them at a time. Given this information, can you now solve this problem in a relatively efficient way? Well, I'm going to show you exactly how to. So what we're realizing is that for any given node, we really have two choices. Either we leave it the same or we XOR that node. But also keep in mind that if we XOR any given node, we must XOR at least another node, any other node in the graph. This is like our choice, right? We either XOR two nodes or we don't do anything. Of course, for any given node, it only has two possible values, the original value or the XOR value. So it's not like there are an infinite possibility of values that any node could be. So this is kind of simplifying the problem. Given this, I think there actually are multiple ways to solve this problem. I'm going to show you the one that I was able to come up with by myself. I think it's a relatively simple one. Um, maybe there's a more simple one. You can feel free to talk about that in the comments, I guess, if you found a better one. Remember that ultimately we are trying to maximize the total sum of values. So we'd only want to do an XOR operation if we increase the total sum of values. So what we should do is, first of all, just look at the delta. Which values are going to end up being increased by the XOR operation and which ones are going to be decreased? Let's go through every single value and figure out the delta after XORing it. And to make this interesting, let's look at the biggest example. Actually, it looks like all the values in that are the exact same, so that's not going to be too interesting. Let's uh, focus on this one. So I'm just going to add like the actual value of every single one of these next to it. So I think this one is a 1, this one is a 2, and this one is a 1 based on this down here. And k 
is equal to three. In binary, this is one. In binary, this is two. In binary, this is three. If we were to XOR one, with three, so we'd take these two and XOR them, it would look like we'd get two as a result. So I'm gonna put the XOR version second. So this is gonna be a two. And so obviously this one would end up being the same. And two XOR with three down here is just gonna be one. So that obviously makes sense because two is gonna be turned back into one. So we'd expect a two to be turned into a one. Okay, so just to draw it a little bit bigger, this was our original array of nums. Now we create another array that I'm gonna call delta. And that is for each of these, was this one increased or decreased when we XORed it? Well, it turned into a two, which you can see like over there. So obviously the delta was a plus one. Two turned into a one, so the delta was a negative one. And then this turned into a two, so the delta was a plus one. Okay, now this is what we care about. Like this is our original sum. So let's just say that so far the total happens to be four originally. Can we increase that total at all? Well, we can pick this plus one delta. We can pick this plus one delta and then add two to the total. Well, imagine for a second that this input array was actually all ones, three ones, and then this was also like a plus one over here. Would we be able to pick all three plus ones? You tell me, based on what I told you earlier, would we be able to pick all three of these? No, there's a reason for that. Try to think about it. This is an odd number. Remember, we can only pick two at a time. So in the context of this problem, when I say I'm picking both of these, this one and this one, I'm saying that... I'm choosing this path. I'm picking this node to XOR and I'm picking this node to XOR and I'm choosing this path. And obviously if this graph was a little bit different, like if this part was like the one and uh, this one was like the two, I know this is really messy, I'm sorry about that, but basically what I'm saying is then we would have chosen this node to XOR and this node to XOR, therefore we would be choosing this path over here that kind of looks like an A or whatever, like this. Notice that these two nodes are not adjacent to each other, but they are connected by a path. Therefore, this one does not get XOR. That's what I'm saying. Okay, now knowing all of that, if you believe me, how do we solve this problem programmatically? We can't just look at the delta array and just pick them. Well, this is the part where we get really, really greedy and we take the delta array and we sort it in descending order because we want to pick the biggest guys and we want to put all the big values at the beginning. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take delta array. We're going to sort it. It's going to look like this one, one and negative one. We're going to go two at a time. Like we're going to look at two adjacent values each time. We're going to look at both of them. We're going to add both of them up and we're going to say, is the sum of these two positive? Is it greater than zero? If it is, go ahead and add it to the total and keep going. Now look at the next two values. Well, this time there aren't two values left, right? So this is the part where we say, okay, we can't do anything. Like there just aren't enough values to look at. So even if this one was a plus one, we wouldn't be able to add all three of them. Now to make it, I guess, a tiny bit more interesting, let's go ahead and actually add a negative one over here. I guess in the context of this problem, that would pretty much mean creating a node over here that has a value of two. So this is the value. And then it turns into a one after we XOR it. So we do have two values left this time, but should we add them to the total? Probably not, because why would we? They don't really contribute anything. They actually make our total even smaller. So we don't include these. We do include these. We get a total of two plus four. That's going to be six. It looks to me that is the correct result of this problem. So this is the explanation of the problem. The overall time complexity is going to basically be bottlenecked by the sorting. That is going to be n log n. But I do think there actually are other solutions to this problem that that actually are just big O of N, but I feel like this is such a hard problem that I want this video to appeal to a wide variety of people that I think showing you the slightly more simple and slightly less efficient solution is actually fine because this one does pass as well. I would hope that in a real interview, this would most likely be enough. I really, really believe that even at Google, this would more than be enough. Also, I want to say that this is harder than the average problem you will see at a company like Google, 100%.
And if someone does ask you this question, they will almost certainly give you some hints, just like I did in the video. Also, of course, we do use extra space, so space complexity is going to be big O of n. Let's code it up. So I guess before I actually clear this, I might as well show you, like, this is how I was able to, like, approach this problem. Again, like, this is a very difficult one. Don't feel bad if you weren't able to solve it by yourself. This was, like, my main thought process. It may or may not help you, but let's actually get into the solution now. We know that the main way to solve this problem is going to rely on this delta array. In Python, it's pretty easy to actually get it. We're going to use something called list comprehension. So for every number in the input, we want to map it to this. We want to take n and XOR it with k, of course. But that's not the delta, right? That's just the new version of that number. To get the delta, we take the new version and subtract the old version. So either it increased or it decreased. Maybe it stayed the same, but overall we care about the delta. And remember, we want to sort this as well. We're going to sort it in descending order. You could, I guess, sort it in ascending order if you wanted to and then just iterate over it in reverse order. But why would we do that? And we want to obviously compute the result, which is going to be the maximum sum of all the values and then return that. And initially, we actually don't need to set it to zero. We actually can set it equal to the sum of the input. And then now we can try to maximize it. So remember, we're going to look at values two at a time in the delta array. So I'm going to say for i in range in Python, you kind of have to do it like this. So from zero all the way to the last index, I guess length of nums. This will pretty much be the last index, though, since this is non-inclusive in Python. And also we want to increment our i pointer by two every single time. So that's what this is saying. Now, what I'm trying to do here, I guess, is take the value at index i in delta and take the value at index i plus one in delta. Now, immediately you can see we might not have an i plus one. What if we were given an odd number of values? We're not going to have an i plus one at some point. So before we even do that computation, we don't want an index out of bounds. Let's just say if i is the last index right now, then we don't have a plus one. And at that point, we should just break out of this loop. OK, so if that's not the case, then we compute this sum. We call it our path delta, or you could say the total delta, it doesn't really matter. At this point, this isn't really a graph problem at all, so we don't really need to call it the path, but oh well. Of course, we want to take this path delta and add it to the result, but we only want to do that if it's positive. In other words, if at any point we get a path delta that is less than or equal to zero, at that point, we're never going to increase our result anyway. Remember, this array is sorted. If these two aren't greater than zero, then there's not going to be any values greater than zero in the rest of the array. So at that point, we might as well just break out of it. This is the entire code. It doesn't look too difficult, does it? But remember, this first line over here is the hard part. It relies on quite a bit of intuition to come up with. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. As you can see on the left, it works and it is shockingly efficient, even though there are linear time solutions for this problem. That just kind of goes to show you that leak code is pretty random. If you found this helpful, check out Nico.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.